The patrons have spoken once again, and this time, they voted for Sandslash. And despite some early anime appearances, such as that one episode with AJ, where he tirelessly trained his Sandshrew to withstand water and also wear a brace, this Pokemon has actually had a quieter presence in terms of popularity during Pokemon's history, even among the diehard Generation 1 fans. Sandslash has never been as cool, cute, or weird as some of the more popular Pokemon. But that's not what we're trying to find out today, so how did it fair competitively. And with that, we ask the question we ask ourselves every week, how good was Sand Slash actually? And in this video, we'll be covering these competitive formats. While the first generation of overuse tends to be harsh and unforgiving to most outside the inner circle of Psychics, Normals, Zapdos, Rocks, and Lapras, Sand Slash actually has a pretty decent niche. This is not to say it's a gimmick that can be used, and while it's exceedingly rare and pretty difficult to use effectively, it's not really something you can just slap on a team. It's a legitimate role. It uses its ground typing to be a Rhydon and Golem-esque pseudo Zapdos check. Pseudo because it doesn't resist Drill Peck, but it does have great defense. It also has a great speed stat, which bypasses Executor and Lapras, Stab Earthquake, a good attack stat, and access to the rare Swords Dance, making it a legitimate threat. In fact, a plus two Earthquake, two hit KOs Snorlax and Lapras, nearly one hit KOs Chansey, and just about always one hit KOs Golem, and also has a great chance to do so against Rhydon. And while its Earthquake won't do much to Executor, a boosted Hyper Beam does 60 to 71%. This is especially relevant when you consider how much damage Executor takes early on in near nearly every game. Basically, after a Swords Dance, Sand Slash 2-hit KOs everything. And while it would often get a full sweep halted by perennial endgame threat Tauros, whose Blizzard preys on Sand Slash's low special, our little spiky shrew could definitely dish out some pain. And that includes a boosted Earthquake, taking 63-74% to 74 off the bull, which is huge for your own Tauros. That said, the low special also was a problem against other late-game Pokemon like Starmie and Alakazam, and setting up isn't the easiest thing in the world thanks to its lackluster special bulk, so unfortunately Sand Slash just isn't a consistent choice. However, as a one-off, Sand Slash has a nice little niche and is very scary if you support it with Paralysis Spread, especially on Starmie, well-placed sleep, and a bit of aggressive initiative taking play. Now on to GSC. In the second generation, Marowak is one of the most fearsome Pokemon with its vicious stab earthquakes backed by Swords Dance. And while Sand Slash doesn't have the same power offered by Thick Club and isn't as notable a presence in the metagame, it can run a similar set that comes with the benefits of Sand Slash's own uniquely distinct set of advantages that provided a real niche as opposed to the gimmick of trying and failing to ape a more successful Pokemon. The set, much like Marowak's standard set, is Swords Dance, Earthquake, Rock Slide, and and hidden power bug. Sand Slash's advantages are the ability to hold leftovers and also having a higher speed. And while Thick Club is what makes Marowak the unique Pokemon that it is, the lack of leftovers is definitely noticeable. It makes it very difficult for it to even take light hits because they stack up and with spikes doing damage even if Marowak doesn't take an attack and its low speed leaving it open to being outsped by a significant chunk of the metagame, it requires great care, both in the team builder and on the battlefield to make better use of it. Sand Slash is more reckless. While it's not switching into attacks will nilly, it can definitely come into something like Tyranitar's Rock Slide or Steelix's Earthquake with spikes down without being seriously crippled. Its ideal scenario is, of course, to switch into a paralyzed Raikou's Thunder. Leftovers are what's key here, but so is its speed, because if Sand Slash had to take two hits before responding, it wouldn't have this niche. Being less forced to run a Rapid Spinner is also a burden lifted off of Sand Slash's teammates. Although if your team is built a certain way and you can play aggressively enough to deny the opponent's spikes, leftovers are even more useful. Marowak sits at 188. This means it is outspeed most crucially by the 208 Twins, Exeggutor and Machamp, as well as the 220 Tyranitar and 228 Vaporeon and Umbreon. Paralysis support is crucial for Marowak to succeed and is strong overall, but cannot be guaranteed. Sand Slash sits at 228 itself, meaning it doesn't have to predict Exeggutor coming in with a hidden power bug. It can freely Source Dance without worry of giving it a free switch. Not being revenged by Machamp's Mighty Cross Chops or even Tyranitar's slightly weaker crunches is incredible for sweeping potential, or even just for staving off a threat, giving Sand Slash and its team some added defensive utility. And while the speed tie against Vaporeon isn't ideal, it's much better as a desperation move than Marowak's utter helplessness if Marowak hasn't managed to stay above 93%. If Vaporeon is forced to rely on Sleep Talk, then the odds are in Sand Slash's favor, especially since Surf has fairly low odds to one-hit KO. But of course, Marowak is the OU staple for a reason. Sand 
Slash's lack of power even after Source Dance can be noticeable in crucial scenarios against Snorlax, Skarmory, and resting non-sleep talk Suicune. And while unboosted, it does not pose much of a threat to anything, and it can be difficult to safely Source Dance since it is threatened by quite a lot. However, the Spiky Shrew does have a solid niche for knowledgeable trainers looking for an unexpected edge over their opponents. Now on to advanced, Sand Slash sadly isn't too effective in the third generation of overuse. Between Skarmory and its new buffed spikes, threats like Gengar, Celebi, Suicune, Flygon, Salamence, and Swampert at every corner, and not even being able to check King Tyranitar's new bag of tricks at all viably, in addition to the new EV system, meaning it lost a huge amount of bulk, thus leaving its abysmal special defense exposed, Sand Slash dropped predictably and significantly. As such, it fell to underuse, but at least there it was a premier threat. Now its water, ice, and grass weaknesses alongside low special defense wasn't great, and it wasn't exactly the fastest thing ever, but it did have a nice place for its speed tier, and it dished out massive damage to everything with Swords Dance. In fact, with a few hits prior, Blastoise would get destroyed, while even Gligar struggled to fend it off. Sand Slash's impressive physical bulk could also help in a pinch against threats like Fearow, and with that, it was at least great and underused. Alright, DPP. Sand Slash was predictably never seen in 4th generation overuse. Just about all its old threats returned, and new ones emerged, including Garchomp, Poison Heal Breloom, Infernape, Heatran, Gliscor, and come Platinum, the Rotom Appliances. In fact, it also even had a tough time in underuse, since it was in strict competition with Dawnfan, who was much more reliable at checking things defensively, spinning and setting up Stealth Rock thanks to its far superior bulk. Even Swords Dance wouldn't even get it very far this time, with how excellent Milotic and Venusaur were. Light Slash variants with Lumberry would cleave through Ghost to pull off a rapid spin, and it could attempt to be cheesy with Sand Veil on the rare Sandstorm teams, but this was still quite a thin niche, and thus Sand Slash unfortunately fell to never use. But there it became one of the most important Pokemon, being able to Stealth Rock easily on weaker Pokemon, which also gave it windows for rapid spinning to clear its own side for the dangerous Charizard to run wild. Now on to black and white. Sand Slash actually had a gimmicky moment in the weather generation. Its dream world ability, Sand Rush, is the same one that got Excadrill banished to Ubers. Thus, some people tried to recreate its fast, rapid spinning, Swords Dance earthquake sweeping success with Sand Slash. But of course, it doesn't have Excadrill's tremendous steel typing, or monstrous attack, or even its speed. Even Jolly won't even outrun Choice Scarf Terrakion, Keldeo, or Latios, whereas Excadrill basically ran past everything with Adamant. As such, Sand Slash was never more than a gimmick, and not a very good one at that. Stoutland was the better post Excadrill Sand Rush abuser, but at least it was nice to see Sand Slash and OU for once. And with black and white underuse resembling Diamond and Pearl overuse, Sand Slash had no use whatsoever there and dropped to the new rarely used. There, it generally wasn't amazing, but it did have a very specific niche. First off, it was Stealth Rock resistant and could easily blow through Spirit Tomb with a Lum Swords Dance set, just like the Diamond and Pearl underused niche, except this time it's made competition was Cryogonal, who was Stealth Rock weak and physically frail enough to get mauled by even Spiritomb's weak pursuit. However, Kabutops could also do this, although it was merely neutral to Stealth Rock. The second part of Sand Slash's niche was blocking Volt Switch from Manetric and Magneton. Pretty specific, but it did exist. However, Kabutops and Cryogonal were the ones continuously topping the usage stats because they were just better overall Pokemon. And sadly, despite never being seen in tournaments, Sand Slash didn't see low enough ladder usage to drop to never use where it likely would have been at least decent, but yeah, oh well. And as for VGC, we did find but one placement for Sand Slash, and basically like no information on what it could run besides, yeah, Sand Rush. It has Sand Rush. Sand Slash was entirely inferior to Excadrill in VGC, but somehow it made a placement on Asher K's team, who reached 15th in the senior division of the 2013 US Nationals. Asher actually used it alongside Excadrill for the double Sand Rush attack, so good stuff to Asher for making it work. Also, Sand Slash does get Super Fang, which can soften things up easily for Excadrill. However, this this was still quite far from being a top metagame strategy. Now on to XY. With not a hope of the slightest niche in OU, UU, or RU, Sand Slash was awful enough to drop to NU this time, and it wasn't even good there. Its only occupiable niche was as a Sand Rush sweeper, and Sand teams were extraordinarily gimmicky and never used. Thus, it never saw much serious usage in tournaments. Buffed Knockoff was nice to really cleave Ghosts open for a spin, but we're still talking a niche Pokemon within a niche playstyle. Not really anywhere near being even middle tier stuff, even in this low environment. Claydol, Hitmonchan, Rhydon, Steelix, Piloswine, Torterra, and Golurk all overshadowed Sand Slash in one way or another, and Sand Slash was just too bland and didn't have any impressive tools to make up for it. 
And finally, Sun and Moon. Regular Sand Slash has become so bad in Generation 7 that while it technically has a niche in PU, it's actually in the tierless limbo. It's untiered. In PU, it is outclassed by Hitmonchan, several Sovali types, and its own Alolan counterpart. Yes, Sand Slash was blessed with an Ice Steel Alolan form in Sun and Moon, with the new speed boosting inhale ability, Slush Rush. And while it wasn't good enough for overuse, despite the seemingly prime setup opportunity from Snow Warning Alolan Ninetales, it did find a new spot in the lower tiers. In NU, it's got a great specially defensive set, being able to switch in easily thanks to its strong resistance to Whimsicott and Vanillux's stabs, as well as its immunity to Toxic Spikes. It then proceeds to support its team with Stealth Rock, Rapid Spin, Toxic, or Knockoff. This is Alolan Sand Slash's main variant. It's also got a role as a strong Slush Rush Sweeper when paired with Vanillux, using its meaty attack and excellent Stab Icicle Crash to cleave through teams, which helps offset its weakness to grounds. The combination of specially defensive supporter and slush rush sweeper are also the two variants Alolan Sand Slash runs in the tier it officially resides in, PU. Although it can also run a Swords Danceless offensive set that's less dedicated to sweeping and more dedicated to team support with a more offensive feel, being able to rapid spin or set up Stealth Rock in matchups where it likely won't be able to go all the way, lending some depth to what its trainer can do with it. With ICMZ turning its already powerful Icicle Crash into an absolutely frigid Sub-Zero Slammer, it blows through common physical tanky Pokemon such as Gastrodon and Kangaskhan. Alolan Slash was a fine Pokemon in the two bottommost Sun and Moon tiers. And now for Gen 7 VGC. Alolan Sand Slash was actually a decently popular Pokemon in the early days of VGC 2017. As a Slush Rush Sweeper alongside Alolan Ninetales or Vanillix, its stabs were strong against Tapu Lele and Bulu, and Tapu Koko wasn't going to be shrugging them off either. There were a decent amount of players who got some pretty good placings at various regionals. In fact, and once again, I'm so sorry if I butcher any of these names, but Brian Yom placed 9th with Alolan Sand Slash at Georgia Regionals, as Stefan Valde Benito used it to reach the same place at the Melbourne Challenge, Jun Young Lee had one en route to reaching top 32 at the Korean Nationals, Mark Jackson used one to reach 7th at the Liberty Garden Invitational, and Emily Golub used one to reach 8th at the Daytona Regionals. But unfortunately, over the course of the season, its usage dwindled because everyone realized that Arcanine was super good, and its fire typing and intimidate was something Alolan Sand Slash really did not appreciate. And thus, Alolan Sand Slash was pretty much extinct by the time Worlds came around. And then in 2018, Incineroar brutally one up to Arcanine, and that's all that really needs to be said. And that's it, so how good was Sand Slash actually? Well, it did have a decent if underused niche in the first two overused generations, with its GSC 1 being particularly fearsome if wielded correctly. Then after that, it was excellent in advanced underuse, but as the generations went on, it fell further and further down the lower tiers, clinging on to the tiniest of niches that you'd never end up using if you actually needed to win. And this resulted in being demoted to the lowest dishonor for a fully evolved Pokemon, untiered. And sad as it may be, Sand Slash went from being decent to despondent over the years. Its Alolan form did breathe some new life back into it, but in the lowest tiers, yes, but some life in it nonetheless. And it also gave it some legitimate appearances in VGC, at least early on. Sand Slash belongs to the group of old Pokemon that just couldn't keep up with the new generations, but was still given something thanks to Nintendo's obsession with rebooting everything from Gen 1 for some reason. Thanks for watching everyone, shout out to the patrons for continued support of our videos, and thank you to them for voting for this Pokemon, and as always if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False White Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And as I always say, well not really, but once again the comment voting is going to be done in the community tab. And there's going to be a post in the community tab around the same time that this video goes up. So please vote over there, I will not be taking comment votes from the comments underneath this video. So I guess this time I want you to comment what you think about Competitive Sand Slash. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got, see you next time everyone.